unreasonable. And it probably just wants to know. Tom, can you first give a case history? Uh, just uh, kind of a typical case history, and then we'll talk in greater detail about what happens. All right, I, I can tell you the biography of a little kid from a hollow in West Virginia whose mom and dad went to Houston to find work. They thought that Houston was the capital of opportunity in America. The dad went out there to get a job, a low-level job with an oil company, brought the mother, then set, sent for little Jimmy and his little brother. Jimmy and his brother got to Houston on a Greyhound bus, and his dad and mom failed to pick him up. How old were they? Jimmy at that time was 12, and his little brother was 6. They spent the night in the terminal, uh, Jimmy fending off the advances of a number of men. And then the dad came to pick him up the next morning. The parents had both gotten drunk and forgotten to pick up the kids. The boys went to live with their parents. The parents both had severe drinking problems. The dad lost his job. The mother got killed in a car wreck. The little boy was severely injured. Jimmy dropped out of school to try to hustle, was his word, money to help keep the family, what was left of it, together. The dad died uh, choking in his own vomit after a drinking bout. And Jimmy was the sole support of himself and his little brother. The rent was coming round, and Jimmy had no money. And then a neighbor kid said to him, you can get $10 just for watching me play with a man. And Jimmy said, that's queer. And his friend said, it's not queer if the guy does it to you. If you just let it happen, and all you have to do is watch. Jimmy did it. Then the man offered Jimmy $25 uh, to let the man play with Jimmy. And Jimmy took it, so he had $35. And then he got introduced into the routine. Jimmy was little, uh, only 12, and he was small for his age. And the circuit he went on in Houston was not the main one, which is Montrose. He went to a place nearby, an arcade called Funland. The way that worked was the boys would stand by the machines, and a man would come by. If the man offered quarters, the boy would take them, and then the man and the boy would go off. Jimmy became a professional prostitute at the age of 12. He survived in that capacity until he was 14. Was he working on his own, or was he part of an organization? He was not part of an organization. He was what they call the Farm League, and he was taking care of his little brother. His brother got killed in a car wreck when he was driving with some people, and Jimmy then was desolate and almost destitute. Uh, he used the last money he had to bury his brother. He did not want to let his last surviving relative, his grandpa in West Virginia, know the way things had gone. Uh, a reporter in Houston last saw Jimmy across the street from Funland, and a man who used to pay boys for sex then told this reporter, I know that boy. He told a man who's a friend of mine that one time he was having sex with that little boy and then he realized that the boy was crying and he looked up and saw that the boy was sucking his own thumb and at that point he had to break off the encounter. The journalist believes that this reformed man who used to use boys was his own best friend, the boy who had been having sex with Jimmy. Jimmy disappeared. His body was later found mutilated, and his grandfather was notified. The police then told the grandpa in a very cruel way that the grandpa shouldn't try to get a loan from the city of Houston. It would have cost $500 to ship the body to, back. Ship the body to West Virginia because the boy was nothing but a harbor whore or worse. Um, and the grandpa died shortly thereafter. Uh, the whole family is dead now. Jimmy was a typical kid. He wasn't looking for this life. He found it. He needed some means of support. He took what he could get, 
and he came to grief and met his death. Uh, Houston is possibly the worst city in the United States for the misuse of lost and runaway boys or homeless defenseless boys. Probably 350 or more boys are killed every year in Houston. About Houston? I would say I hear about Houston that it is the worst. Uh, that children are brought to Houston from places such as New Orleans or from other parts of uh, the Southwest. Their life is sad. It's 100% it's sad. They get up, you know, one or two or three during the day and they go out and they have to earn money and they're treated bad. Uh, they eat only when they're fed by somebody else and they never get anything for anything. They always have to return sexual favors for it. They sometimes get beaten, they get robbed, they get pushed. You know, the police abuse them, everybody abuses them. One young man got out of a car, by young man I mean the age of probably 15, maybe 16, and he got out of the car and he was just badly beaten. I mean, there's no two ways about it. He looked right at him and his face was black and blue and blood coming out of his nose and his lip was fat and he couldn't walk very well and he was sick to his stomach in the bushes and he was just very badly beaten. Evidently he had got either a bad trick or the man was on S and M or something and just kind of like shoved him out of the car as he went around the corner open the door for him and say, get out. Any of them ever want to hurt you? That's why I watch out for them. You watch out for them? Yeah. How do you tell? No, they start to jump now. What, jump on you? Yeah, if they do, you know, I get, I'll be ready because I'll be watching every time. What do you be doing then? i just be laying down on the bed letting them suck and just watch them. But if they start to jump on you, what can you do? I always carry a pocket knife or something like that. I don't know if they hurt me or not. You know, I just watch out for them, just in case they do start. Nine, nine out of ten of them are weird. I mean, they get, you know, there was one guy that picked me up in Atlanta, and he just said, that, you know, he wanted somebody to go out and have a few beers when he would smoke a joint. And we got over there, and I was drinking his beer, and all of a sudden, you know, <laughs> doing like that, you know, I couldn't even see straight. My eyes were rolling back. And then the room started spinning and I was out of it. When I came around, he had me tied up in the basement, no less, way up like this, you know. And I couldn't even move. Did he tie it up? Yeah, stretched. What was he doing to you? Nothing. He was just sitting there with this whip, looking like he's going to hit me with it. He just threatened me a lot. And I was sitting there crying and scared to death, you know, because the worst they could do is kill me, you know. That interview was conducted several months ago in Houston, Texas. Investigators now fear that the 15-year-old is dead. The body of a young man found ritualistically dismembered in Missouri is thought to be his. I woke up and he had he was clamping handcuffs on me. I was laying on my stomach. The other two were on their stomach and they were handcuffed and their feet were tied. The most shocking and horrifying result of older men having sex with young boys is the story of Dean Coral in Houston, Texas, and more recently John Gacy in Chicago. In Houston, Coral lured or had brought to his home at least 27 young boys, all under the age of 17. The boys were sexually assaulted, then killed. In Houston, I, I give the figure based on, I think, prudent calculations that upwards of 350 boys a year are killed deliberately because of this. Many more die of drug overuse, mal malnutrition, of suicide. The national toll per year is in the thousands every year. Kids die violently because of this. In the first three months of this year, 1981, 30 boys were found dead in Houston. None of them was called a homicide. They were found to be dead of exposure, dead of causes undetermined, dead of massive internal bleeding, as in the case of one child under 10 who was found naked in a Dempsey dumpster with his colon and his rectum torn apart. He was called not a homicide, but a victim of massive internal injury. He was fist raped. Yes. What, what is the sort of psychic roots or the nature of this uh, phenomenon? I've been studying this phenomenon since the spring of 1979, and to the best of my knowledge, most men who seek sex from boys are not homosexuals. To the extent that they have active sex lives uh, at the peer level, 
they are heterosexual. Many of them have no peer sex at all. There are gay people who are what we call pederists, that is, men who lust after children, especially boys. But it appears to be the case that most such men are not gay, that their uh, attraction is for young, defenseless children, especially boys, because they're more exotic and more forbidden. But uh, it is not a matter of uh, gay rights as advocated by practically anybody. This is a, a much different sort of phenomenon. The reason that the gay community usually scorns any investigation of the subject is that they know that the average person in the public will blame homosexuals and homosexuality for the phenomenon, regardless of what facts are presented. Well, this is not just a sexual thing in the way we talk about it. It's a, a power trip, and it's also uh, a sadistic thing because these kids are tortured and killed. Who do you think those people were? Those were not just ordinary people there. If I told you their names, I'm not going to tell you their names, but if I did, I don't think you'd sleep so well. The kind of individuals involved are down the line, almost in every instance in the cases I've investigated, men who are very powerful, usually very wealthy, and usually administrate control over a large number of people. Wealthy Houstonians can and do obtain boys in a most discreet manner. It's gotten a little more sophisticated now. It's gotten more, uh, uh, it's gotten more expensive. Prices, higher prices are paid. Uh, and it's, it's gotten a little more sophisticated in terms of, um, oh, I think the types of people who are, who are into it, types of adults who are into it, professional people. Uh, Houston uh, professional people? Yeah, yeah. Soliciting boys? Oh, sure. You know, I mean, you can be a millionaire in Houston, man. <laughs> yeah. You have people here that are so wealthy that they can't let anybody know what they're doing that they're willing to pay two, three, four hundred dollars a night, you know, for one of these boys not to say anything about them. You know, you got judges, doctors, lawyers, politicians, uh, advertising people involved in in buying young people, for either, if it's for an hour, or for a night, or for a month, or for a year. They actually have white slavery in this country. It's a fact. And in, in Houston, right now, it's going on. Tom, is there any uh, evidence that there's any connection with organized crime? Obviously, with other forms of prostitution that we know about, there are close connections. The mafia has always utilized prostitution as one of the pillars of its organizations and sources of its income. Is there any connection here that has been revealed uh, with organized crime? Yes. When we're talking about 400 kids on the street between 2 and 4 in the morning in a city like Houston, there's very little organization. There may be a runner or a pimp who's trying to squeeze the boys a little, but there's no big businessman running a sophisticated operation. But when there is a bookstore with 40 stalls, uh, there's often a stable of boys. That's, that's fairly good-sized business. And there's bigger business than that. That's the call boy operations, like this one we described with the 10,000 customers. That's big business. It's crime. It's organized. But it's not the mafia. It's the pillars of our society. Uh, there is big business, mm -hmm. organized crime. It's sophisticated. It's closely attached to the major financial, commercial, industrial, educational institutions of our society. It's run by the same people who run those. It's frequented by the same people who occupy management positions in those. It's not the mafia. It's, it's an adjunct of clean business. It's serving the most respectable people we have in our society, the people who uh, are the elite. I assume you can't name names at this particular time, but... Not if people haven't been apprehended yet. Right, okay. Are senators involved? U U.S. Senators well, and but congressmen, do you suppose? Let me give you some information here. Now, this is stuff that has come out of newspaper clippings. It has gotten far enough to get in the newspaper, even if it hasn't been followed up. 
this was potentially the biggest case of all. Is that the one in New Orleans? Yes, a New Orleans Boy Scout troop was busted for actually being a callboy ring of boy prostitutes. The man who was the leader of the Boy Scout troop was given 75 years in prison, and then he offered to tell a story. The story he told was that the congressional delegations from two states, one of which was Louisiana and one of which bordered Louisiana, and, as he put it, the entire hierarchy of one of the states, as far as top political posts, were all involved as customers of the little boys. And he said he was willing to name all the names. Uh, that was a UPI story of 26 November 1979, and he never talked again. Is he, he in said, jail now? Is he in he's prison? still in jail. He said there was one U.S. senator and many congressmen. Weren't there a couple, uh, actually, right wing, uh, new right um, representatives, congressmen in Washington, Bauman. who yeah. were actually um, well, found uh, guilty of molesting? <laughs> Doug, I wish you were right. Mm -hmm. uh, Congressman Robert Bauman mm -hmm. was apprehended in February of 1980, mm -hmm. having sex with a 16-year-old boy. For some reason, no charges were brought until September 1980. At that point, the FBI and the U.S. Attorney made an agreement to keep all details of the account out of public records. The charges were dropped on Bauman's promise that he would take a drug or an alcoholic abuse treatment program. He continued in office and he ran for re-election. He was defeated, but he said he would go on to run again. William F. Buckley is one of his closest friends. They were co-founders of Young Americans for Freedom and the American Conservative Union. The way Buckley put it was this, it transpires that during alcoholic bouts he engages in homosexual acts. He went on to say there was a complaint filed by a 16-year-old boy. And then he went on to say Bauman should resign from Congress and resign from the positions in conservative organizations because he was an embarrassment. <laughs> Bauman never went to trial. He didn't actually go to a formal pretrial hearing either. Then there was a Texas Congressman Wyatt who was caught. Uh, well, actually, I, I take it back. He was not caught. A, a juvenile reported that why did force sex on him charges were never filed that's a quote charges were never filed despite the fact that the boy had filed a complaint and Wyatt said he was going to run again uh, when it was published in the Austin paper that uh, the complaint was not that he was drunk driving but that he had forced sex on a juvenile male he said he wouldn't run again he was already in the alcohol rehabilitation program, so there was no trial, no pretrial hearing, no charges. Wasn't there another another uh, ring of uh, tour guides, boys as tour guides for congressmen? Well, that you may be referring to the case of Representative Hinson, a Republican from Mississippi, who was found having sex with uh, somebody in the men's room of the Longworth House office building. Uh, there are conflicting accounts. Uh, according to one account, he was having sex with a minor. According to another account, he was having sex with an adult. He uh, said he was innocent, and he agreed to undergo alcohol abuse treatment, and he was not charged. This, well, there, there was something. The charges were dropped. Well, what was the story about the about the young boys being tour guides for the Capitol, and this was also part of. Uh, a little boy sex ring, and uh, also uh, some of it resulted in campaign contributions. I read that in an article. That has to do with the state of Texas, as a matter of oh, fact. Texas. And uh, here's the way we can tell that story. <laughs> this is one you can't tell. <laughs> well, this is one we can't. It I got into I, the newspaper. Yeah, I saw it in the newspaper. But then it disappeared. Oh. What appeared in the newspaper was a boy's home run by a Texas state representative was being investigated for charge of abuse of the boys. The state representative said that there was no abuse. He claimed that his, his place could not be investigated by the state because it was uh, private, like that of uh, Lester Roloff. Rev Reverend Roloff. The story died and didn't appear in the press anymore. Uh, 
the lead that uh, produced the initial story was that that representative took co campaign contributions and then the uh, contributors, as a reward, got to have sex with the boys in the home. And that he did this for more than himself, but for other representatives. That man is out of the state legislature. So we've talked about legislators, congressmen, a senator, senators, um, people in the the highest ranks of uh, government at, at the local, at the uh, state level. Now, are these just aberrations, or is this part of a widespread, ongoing thing? I think it's very widespread. Uh, and not just among powerful politicians. We've talked about politicians. But it seems to be the case that in all high-powered professions, uh, corporations now we're talking about, too. Right? Corporations, uh, medicine, law, even the university, not necessarily professions with uh, bloated salaries, but prestige, some power, influence and above all pressure the men involved are susceptible to this kind of deviation i'm working right now you know like just you know with the corporation and what's that how's that work well uh, when their executives or you know their business people are in town uh, they're sent to our apartment and we entertain them while they're here Okay, what's that entertainment usually involved? What do they usually demand, or what do they want? Well, it's all kinds of sex and perversions. There's no two alike. I've decided that. Everyone's in for something different, so I can't really stereotype the whole. You know, all the men want different things? Yeah, right. But we're usually in the passive side, and they're usually the dominant player. You do a great hospital. He's a um, one of them people that um, operates on people. He's a what? Uh, a doctor. Uh, we've talked about those men who have achieved power, and also among those men who wanted it but didn't get it. Mm -hmm. Men like poor Gacy in Chicago, who killed at least 33 boys. He was not a well-to-do man, but he was a joiner. He paid high dues to join men's clubs. He paid $1,000 to join the president's club so he could have dinner with Jimmy Carter. Instead, he had dinner with Mrs. Carter and had his picture taken with her. He was uh, an upward striver. He killed at least 33 boys. He offered in his defense that he could not identify any of the 33 boys by face or by name because he had had sex with 1,500 different boys in the previous five years, 300 different kids a year, and most of them, as he said, were prostitutes. He didn't snatch them off the street. He went out and bought their services, and then he coerced them, as this lawyer in Washington says no one ever does. He made them captives, and he killed them. What about women in the positions of power in government? And You don't find women involved in this? Well, you don't I find many women involved in positions of power in the uh, American yeah, Maybe that system. explains the what appears to be the fact. Women don't do this to little girls. Heterosexual women, homosexual women, don't do this to little girls. Or little boys. Or little boys. I mean, it happens, but it's not common, it's not ordinary, it's not a phenomenon. It isn't a threat. Uh, if you have a little girl and you have an adult female friend, you needn't have any apprehension. But if you have little kids who are boys, they are in more danger than the little girls today. Why, why do you think uh, there's so much violence uh, caught up in this? Investigations in other cities have shown that boys, 13, 14, even younger, are coerced into prostitution with threats of physical violence and are sometimes shipped across state lines, shipped to the older adult men who desire young boys for sexual acts. Occasionally, these boys' episodes with their older clients ends in physical violence. There are men who seek young boys to torture 
and sometimes to kill. This phenomenon is not unique to America. Uh, it may not even be unique to advanced industrial urban societies. In the other places where it occurs, though, it doesn't seem to be attended by a high level of mayhemic violence. In, in the United States, it is. In Islamic countries, for instance, uh, prostitution with boys is a standard. I've been in Morocco and Algeria and observed this, and yet I've never heard any stories of violence being involved. In other words, it's an erotic phenomenon as opposed to this power or psychological um, well, there are those who would have us believe that that is the case in America. Uh, here, for instance, is an article written by a law professor in Washington, D.C., who was general counsel to the Metropolitan Police Department. This article was written in 1981. He says, if the boys are victims, it is largely in the technical sense. It is more accurate to characterize them as entrepreneurs who by and large understand their own motivations. They do it for money, for drugs, for pleasure, and perhaps for some as a crude gambit for emotional sustenance. But unlike teenage girl prostitutes, they do not act out of fear. There is no coerced recruitment, no whippings, no incarcerations in their rooms, and no sweet-talking pimps with Cadillacs. That's not what I have found. So you think that's study. false, that Washington police chief? I think it's false, and I think it's a deliberate falsehood. Mm. Well, let's talk about, we haven't talked about the proliferation in the United States of this. We've talked about a few individual cases. How widespread is it, and what are the numbers we're talking about? Well, we know this, for instance. This is a standard. Uh, a half a million kids run away or are thrown out of homes every year in the United States, and the majority of them are boys. Another thing that the president's uh, commission on obscenity found this is the commission that richard nixon repudiated it mentioned in passing that child pornography was a phenomenon of the abuse of children and then went on to say that for every female prostitute of any age in the united states there are nine boys under age who are prostitutes that is a finding which is debatable and it is a speculation but it went unnoticed. Uh, I think, though, that if, uh, if you get in a car and prowl the streets of the capitals of this practice, Houston, New Orleans, Atlanta, Chicago, New York, Los Angeles, and to a much lesser extent, uh, Austin, our state capital, and Washington, the nation's capital, you'll find that boys are the ones hustling more than the women. Mark, uh, some of the research that you did in Austin here that started off your involvement in this issue indicated that there was a possible ring of homosexual boys in Austin. Could you tell some of the uh, facts on this case? Well, my interest in this whole issue originated when, as a reporter for the Daily Texan, we heard through the grapevine that a pharmacist here in town had been busted. And I don't remember the original charge I'm not sure if it was abuse of a boy in a home I guess it was abuse of a that's right abuse of a boy in a uh, halfway house well the thing that interested us about the case was that the police had later found in his home a file an index file of anywhere from two to five hundred names of young boys in the around the Travis County area and counties uh, accompanying Travis County and it had their names, phone numbers, parents' names, in many cases, sexual uh, statistics on the, on the uh, personnel, height, age, weight, and in some cases, preferences. And that sounded like an astounding thing to us, that there should be somebody traveling around. And what he did was we, he would hang out at high schools and, and offer the drugs that he had available, as he was a pharmacist, in exchange for sexual favors. Well, we followed that up, and, and uh, somewhere down the line of judicial uh, scrutiny, the entire, the evidence was lost, or disappeared, or was unable to be retracted. And there, there, it complicates from there, but that's, a, that's how we got it. Well, Anderson, that. his name was Anderson, Robert Anderson. He was found guilty of one charge and sentenced to two years in prison. And then he skipped 
he was he was still not incarcerated. He skipped, and he's never been found again. Was there any indication that he was involved with other men who were participating in these favors? In other words, yes. what would the point of him keeping these uh, cards be, unless there was some sort of business or organization? He was an agent. He was an agent, and he had uh, quantities of drugs. Uh, Mark didn't mention that he listed next to the name of each boy that boy's personal drug preference. Mm -hmm. yeah. And he also had a, a very large quantity of muscle relaxants to administer to boys mm -hmm. to make sex easier for the men. Not only that, but there was also the names of several, several well-known business uh, men in the Texas community that for obvious reasons were contacts okay what about you talked about boy scout groups and boys homes what about these well a boy's home is an ideal place if you want to get in on an operation and get hold of some vulnerable kids it's an ideal place to do it in san antonio this august two men who were supposed to be catholic priests uh, were arrested for sodomizing 50 boys, ages three and a half to 14, that year, and they had had uh, several hundred boys in the past three years. They were having sex with the boys on a regular basis. That was why they established the home, to get at little boys. Uh, in Dallas, uh, a place was closed down the year before. In Houston, uh, Jimmy was in a home in Houston for a while, and he was raped by his caretaker. That place was closed down. In Houston, there are only 42 beds available in all the homes for boys in the whole city. And one of the homes that's still open was previously investigated and arrests were made because of attacks on the boys. It's very common. It's very hard to trust any place that presents itself as a home for boys. And one of the tragedies of that is when somebody opens one that is clean, like Covenant House in New York City, operated by Father Bruce Ritter. The first thing that happens is there's a smear campaign against it, and everybody says it's dirty, too. So if there's a clean one, it gets a bad name. The object is that, that to make it impossible to tell the good ones from the bad ones. I guess the Boy Scout people have this problem, too, don't yes. they? Yes. Uh, we've mentioned a, a couple of Boy Scout rings. That doesn't mean that the Boy Scouts right. are an organized group <laughs> to uh, feed pederists. Uh, Yes, what, what about judges and police? Judges and police are in high-pressure professions, they're involved, too. And uh, in some of these, too, then. To my knowledge, the police are involved less as practitioners of this than the other stressful professions, by far. Um, we mentioned... I should have mentioned the mm -hmm. clergy. With all mm -hmm. regret, the clergy is highly susceptible to this. Real priests, not just bogus priests like those in yes. San Antonio. You mentioned some of the uh, worst uh, phenomena here, these mass murders in uh, Houston and in Chicago. Does this connect with Atlanta in any way? There's been, as you know, mass murders of all these black children in Atlanta. And as I recall, the FBI, uh, when they initially got in the case, after they made this a federal case, um, Reagan, or I guess it was Bush, went down there, um, the FBI came out with a report that indicated that there may be sex abuse of some sort in the death of these children. Then it seemed to be pretty much dropped after an initial uh, play in the media. Do you have any comments on that? Yes. The first indications that leaked out that maybe the kids who were victimized in Atlanta, murdered, were actually boy prostitutes who went to the people in the cars to make contact, uh, came out in February. And then uh, national or cable news network and ABC News tried to mention this as a possibility. It's a very delicate thing. It's almost an insult and affront to the black community to say the angels of Atlanta were really prostitutes, unless you believe, as I do, and unlike that law professor I quoted, unless you believe they're victims. They're not responsible for what what is happening. They are being used and abused. But the public reaction was chilly, so the networks dropped it. They revived it in April and dropped it again. I have headlines here, quotations from news broadcasts about the boys'
possibly being hustlers and that the fellow who has been arrested and indicted being a photographer pr procurer uh, among the mothers of the first ten kids, those women who went public and talked about the, their predicament, uh, is one who said to the wire services in an interview, I'm afraid my son was involved in prostitution. I'm afraid that that's what got him killed. I'm afraid it's the link to the whole series of murders, and no newspaper in America printed the wire service copy. Isn't um, part of this whole uh, phenomenon dealt with a business of pornography, child pornography, oh, where pictures yes. are taken of these acts, uh, films are made, and this Wayne Williams we know is a yeah, photographer, photographer, and we know he has training in electronics. He'd done radio work, he'd done recording work, so might he be involved in a film um, organization, and indeed possibly even a snuff organization. There's been some evidence about uh, snuff films where people are literally killed um, on film and that these are distributed, the films. So is there some possibility that that might be involved? I think in it's possible and I think it's likely. But we're talking about an ongoing case and I, I think we have to be very careful about what we say. Uh, in Houston, I have seen myself big vans that don't have cabs on them. And I've seen young kids go into the van and not emerge for an hour or an hour and a half. And sometimes with the door open, I've seen photographic equipment inside. A raid was made on a mansion in Houston, although the newspapers in Houston referred to it as a flat. It was a mansion. Inside that mansion was more photographic equipment than KLRN, KLRU possesses. And that's one of the biggest <laughs> stations in the Southwest. Uh, bigger than Channel 13 in Houston possesses. Channel 13 played up the raid, but the news media besides Channel 13 didn't. It was as if uh, five guys in a little studio were taking candid camera shots of kids. They were producing books in there. There was also an arrest in Houston uh, in 1981 of a man who sold 20 different films, child pornography films, to somebody from Boston now, he was committing several fe federal crimes in doing that. Right. And among those films, although the newspapers would not print the information, uh, among those films was that of an infant being sexually used by men and a film in which somebody appears to have been murdered. Uh, that, that person hasn't gone to jail yet. What uh, about the bookstores and the, <clears throat> the places where they show movies and stuff like this? Here, here in town, for instance. I think that how much you don't find much evidence of this sort of thing in the bookstores because it's the people who are trading and, and dealing with this kind of thing. It's a very clandestine operation, and it, having gone through an investigation myself, I know how absolutely impossible it is to trail this stuff. I mean, you're dealing with people who are not stupid. You know, they are in levels of power because they're intelligent people, by and large, uh, and they they cover their tracks, and they're not about to be dealing with them through the bookstores. I think maybe five years ago you could find that sort of thing. But now it's, I think it's been pretty much cleaned up. Tom may have more. Well, I went into a, a bookstore in Austin two years ago in daylight. And my experience is the difference between the operation in daytime and nighttime is the difference between night and day. Yet, in daylight, I first bought a magazine that had pictures of people of borderline age. They could have been 18, they could have been 17, and 17 is legal. And then I had the names of illegal publications. I first asked for a register that listed uh, boys by description. Uh, it was a, a catalog, the order of boy. I asked for yeah, that. In a bookstore, yeah. here in Austin? Yeah, or, yeah. it's a crime to, to print that to reproduce it, to distribute it, to buy it, to possess it. I, I broke the law by saying, I want that. And the other guy reached under the counter and handed it to me. Then I said, what about this? And he handed me that. And I said, what about this one? And he handed me one more. And I walked out of there with a lot of illegal goods. Mm -hmm. It was in the daytime. Uh, I understand that as of now, 1981, the same bookstores don't let somebody they don't know do that sort of thing, even at night. <laughs> But I've been in places uh, in Houston within the last several months. One in particular I can describe to you had 40 cubicles. 
where supposedly men go in and put in quarters to watch dirty movies. And outside every cubicle was a little boy. I was approached both by little boys as if I were a man who might want a boy, and I was approached by older men who, in the dark, thought I looked young. Uh, that was on a weeknight, not on Friday or Saturday, in Houston. When I started following up, some films that we heard were circulating in the Houston area. I called an old friend of mine while I was investigating another case involved in this because we heard that it had been viewed by the district attorney's office in Houston. This friend was a good friend who I'd known through, from bars, you know, I mean, in a very social atmosphere, not a professional one. And I called him to ask about if he had heard anything about this film or viewed it himself, perhaps. He answered the phone, I said, hello, and we chatted for a moment. I said, by the way, have you heard anything about this film? And he cut me off and said, I've never talked to you before in my life. Boom. And, and I've never talked to him again. And I've known this guy for a couple of years. Mm -hmm. and as soon as I mentioned that film, it's like... Uh, when Boys for Sale was shown on TV, it was shown first as a nightly series, and then there was a summary program. The biggest bank in Houston withdrew its advertising from the show and from the station because it showed that program. Wow. And uh, the bank managed to get the other, the other advertisers for that program to withdraw their advertising. And if I might interject this just for a moment, uh, because it, was, it ties into the power uh, problems. I remember originally with the, the Robert Anderson, the pharmacist we talked about earlier, one of the items found in his apartment was a wallet, or checkbook, I guess, with a student's address and name on it. Well, we started to make some phone calls and try to contact this person. We finally got through to his father, and it turned out it was the one of the major banks in Dallas. His father was the bank president, and we thought we had a hot lead going. And next thing we know, a, a very, I can't mention names here, but a, a very powerful law enforcement agency head called us. We were asking about this individual's name in Dallas. And he called us back and said, and it was so cryptic that it was unusual, he just said, all I can say is forget Dallas. You know, like, don't touch it. Mm -hmm. The Texas House Committee has been charged with looking at the problem. Two public hearings later, the committee has been unable to make any serious progress. Its budget was slashed from 80000 to $15,000, hardly enough to do an honest probe. And the committee chairman admits to knowing of the problem in Houston, but says he's been told to back off. When we started this committee, we asked for money to do an adequate investigation to determine just how serious the problem of child pornography, child prostitution, sexual exploitation is here in Texas, which I think is, is a, a proper a thing for this committee to do. Now, that was the first indication that we had pressure on us. The second indication was when I appeared before the House Administration Committee, when they chopped our budget and subsequent conversations with certain members that said, we're, we have got to stop our investigation. Why do they want you to stop? I don't know why. I have no... you plan I, to find out? I plan to find out. I think it's serious that, they're, that they we're getting this kind of pressure. Let's continue talking about this situation. You have a story here which kind of is uh, uh, good for several aspects of who's involved, what happens to them, and what doesn't happen to them. Okay, I'll read a wire service release which came out of Dallas and which said at the top, broadcasters note nature, repeated broadcasters note nature, and also said note discretionary material. Here's the copy. A 30-year State Human Resources Department employee has been arrested in Dallas on charges of sexually abusing a child. The Department of Human Resources officials say 55-year-old Howard Ray Parker was suspended yesterday from his job as Medical Services Programs Director at statewide. Police say they found two to 300 pictures of nude boys in Parker's home. Wow. Officers say a 16-year-old runaway boy alleged Parker had sex with him while he lived with Parker. A spokesman for the Department of Human Resources in Dallas says the 30-year veteran employee charged on sex offenses has been suspended without pay. It goes on to say that this is routine procedure. 
uh, repeats that he's charged with the abuse of a child he picked up on the street as the kid was hitchhiking. The, it says that the boy alleges that Parker kept him in that apartment of his for a month and that Parker repeatedly attacked him during that time. Police say a search of Parker's house uncovered two to three hundred photographs of boys in various states of attire, and many showed them engaging in sex. Now, it happens to be the case that those boys were charges of the Department of Human Resources. And here's what happened in the case. Mr. Parker went under the care of a psychiatrist. The psychiatrist said that prosecution would be uh, damaging to Mr. Parker and prevent his recovery. The judge took that into consideration in the pretrial hearing and let him go. And the state of Texas paid for his psychiatric care and they returned him to the job after his rehabilitation. He went back to work. He went back to work. What about the kids? Did they do anything to rehabilitate them? <sighs> Whatever they were supposed to be doing in the first place. Let's take a look at the children involved and their lives. Robin Lloyd, author of For Money or Love, the definitive book on boy prostitution in America. I think that it's been described as a national national horror. I don't think it's a national horror. I think it's a national tragedy. My findings are that the boys that get into this, as, as described in the title of the book, For Money or Love, they're not really in it for the money. I think that they're in it for what they perceive to be adult attention or adult affection. Um, that's where it becomes a tragedy. If you take a 12-year-old boy who comes into a strange town, he's broke, he's cold, he doesn't have anything, he's hungry, and then the other street boys will tell him, hey, you know, you've got something you can sell. And he finds he has this marketable commodity I mentioned earlier. So now he goes to the apartment with a strange man. They go to bed together. The next day he's out on the street and he's looking for now the, the same kind of, of, of protection that same night. Their life is sad. It's 100% it's sad. They get up, you know, one or two or three during the day and they go out and they have to earn money and they're treated bad. Uh, they eat only when they're fed by somebody else and they never get anything for anything. They always have to return sexual favors for it. They sometimes get beaten, they get robbed, they get pushed. You know, the police abuse them, everybody abuses them. What do you do with the money? Spend on um, I had to stay with somebody, I paid them that, or uh, just give me something even I needed. And I bought some shoes or some socks or whatever I need. How much you guys getting for trick? You gotta be able to make some bucks. We, we gotta get more than five dollars. Mm -hmm. Trying to use some money, but when we need it bad. Oh, you need three bucks for days over. Oh, no. So I can make money, man. There's no other way. No other way you can make money? That's true, there is. Can't find no Coke around these days. People already took them all up. Oh, no. I can't get a job. I ain't going to a job. Yeah. Most of the kids don't want to be where they are. They don't want to engage in this lifestyle. And if you give them help, uh, an awful lot of them, a very high percentage of them, are quite anxious either to go home or to uh, get a job, go back to school, to live a normal, happy life. They are not into this really rotten thing because they like it. If they stay in it long enough, they develop attitudes that make it very difficult for them to do anything else. If you work here in our center and you do not develop a bad memory, you don't work here very long. The tragedies, the, the violence, the, the, uh, the fact that some of the kids that come into us are killed because they cannot escape the, the exploitation. It is a very hard thing to bear. Our staff does not really last very long here. Who's running? I can't tell you. Why? They do something? Someone. Yeah, I understand what you're saying. Well, if they have that many kids, what's, what's their... Uh... Where, where is it located? I mean, is it what part of town? I'm not sure. But you're not going to tell me the location. I'm killing them. If they're running slowly, slowly yeah. breaking figures, right. totally anxious. Yeah. All you have to do is. The youth then detailed how boys are procured and then held by the servants. Strictly all the boys are being closed circuit. 
all the boys from Houston. Oh no, these guys, you know, like hitchhikers that are hitchhiking in, they pick them up, give them a place to stay, and then tell them, look, you owe us some money. All fairly young? Very young. What's the youngest? Uh, nine. Nine years old. Well, this is one little kid. Little but brother. they have all the way up to what, 18, 20? 20. 20. Now, do, they, do they provide y'all with protection? I mean, are they protected? No, Vice doesn't touch them. But you don't know why. Or do you know why? I don't know why. All I know is Vice doesn't touch them. Do they teach the kids how to perform sexually at this point? Do they teach them how to do I mean, like, well, usually they get some... It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, the train. <laughs> what happens if a kid won't perform? Do they kind of get down on him pretty heavy? <laughs> no, they just get rid of him. Well, how do they keep him quiet? Yeah, so he won't talk. Well, they usually have an exam. Well, once they'll break a finger or two. Have they done that in front of you? Yeah, they've done it a couple of times. Some John, you know, they like, didn't pay up. One time they took him into the room and they broke his finger. Boys told our undercover investigator, a former drug rehabilitation counselor and sex therapist, that they are not proud of what they do. You don't live at home? I go home once in a while. Do your mother know you do that? She doesn't care? She don't like me come around the house too much. I'm kind of like, if I do that, she don't like me come around too much. Why not? She says she just don't like her son being hustling and stuff like that. She knows you're hustling? Yeah. This dude wanted to take some pictures of me for a hundred dollars tonight. You know, stuff like that. <laughs> this is stupid stuff. Well, Seven. You can, yeah. Why do you say it's stupid? You're doing it. Well, hey. <laughs> you gotta live. I'm ashamed of it too. You're ashamed of it? Sure. Why? Hey man, I wasn't brought up this way. <laughs> what kind of family are you from? Uh I have real nice people. I mean, you know, it was me that messed up. Your parents know what you're doing? Oh, no. She know I'd never let him know. I, I, God. <laughs> and I've heard him too many ways already. Well, the reason I'm here is, you know, when I was 13 years, well, I was 10 years old when my mom got remarried. And when she did, this thing she married came into my room and raped me. And they had to take me to the hospital and put three stitches in me. You know, That's when you were 10? Yeah. So then what happened? How'd you end up leaving home? When I, when I turned 13, I just, you know, packed up my bags and trucked mine. What do your parents think you're doing, or what's your mother think you're doing then? <laughs> I don't know what they think. I haven't written them a letter since, uh, year before last. They don't care, you don't think? No. This boy was partially a victim of poverty. On the streets, though, you find boys from varied backgrounds. One 15-year-old from a wealthy family tells of being cast out because he was failing in school. His parents are divorced. Neither his father nor his mother wants to care for him. He started out as a prostitute when he was 12. You going to keep hustling your kids? Yeah, I have to. I mean, you know, where's a 15-year-old going to get a job, man? is isn't too likely. What do you think about what you do? You proud of it? No. I think uh, disgusting, revolting, you know. Why went do something that's disgusting and revolting? Well, you got to eat and you got to sleep, you know? Well, the worst they could do is kill me, you know? Well, that's pretty bad. Yeah. I mean, aren't but you worried about that? Don't you value your living? Not right now, I don't. You don't value your life? <laughs> Not really. You don't want to stay mean, alive? I mean, I, I want to stay alive and all, but, you know, if I die, what the f***? I mean, it can't be much for <laughs> I know. I mean, is it that bad out there? Don't you, don't you look forward to the day when you get a, a good job? Yeah, but that's all I can do is look forward, you know. I live each day as it comes. So you're really not happier? No. I'd much rather be at home, you know. Well, down in Houston, they have streets where they hustle, which you don't find in some other cities, right? That's right. Uh, what kind of a... Now, this is apparently... These are the entrepreneurs, as the... Uh, DC guy talked about, right? These are cold little kids looking for uh, money to, to buy some food, money to get a room, hopefully with some privacy, uh, with somebody if they can't get any privacy. Uh, to put it in, in, in the bluntest terms, 
At two in the morning, when the bars close, the boys who've had only one customer that night and need more money, or haven't had any customers at all, start bidding against each other for the favors of whatever pederasts are patrolling the street. You've actually observed this. Yes, right yes. That's at 2 o'clock. It lasts for about an hour, a little longer, and then some kids are left, and many of them have nowhere to go. They might have what they call a trick pad that they can go to, and I hope they get the 25 bucks to pay the rent there the next day. I've seen them climb under cars to get shelter and warmth. To and sleep, if, you mean? Yes, at 4 in the morning on this one night in November when it was cold, and the boys had T-shirts on, not jackets, and they didn't have jackets. These are mostly uh, destitute, what you might say, street people. Well, they might come from well-to-do uh, homes, Doug, but when they're, they're gone for a few months, they're, they're poor. Now. They are now poor. A rough count that I made was that there are 400 kids in uh, an area of uh, half a square mile. Is there any... Uh, now, let me finish okay, the story. Sure. The police then came and rounded them up in vans, and I heard over police radio that their count was that there were 400 kids. And they drove them to a suburb of Houston called Pasadena and let them out. Mm. Why did they do that? They did it because if they formally arrested them, they would have had to book them and put them someplace, and they had no room for them. If they had room for them, they couldn't have protected them from other people in the jails. They didn't have the heart to arrest them. Uh, it, technically, they arrested them by taking them into custody, but they didn't have the heart to do any more. They wanted to clean up the street because this was the week before the national election in 1980. They had no place to find shelter for them because there were only 42 beds in the whole city and some of those were questionable as to their safety for the boys. So they took them for a ride and let them out. They didn't have anything else to do. Tom, is race a factor here and if so, in what degree, what extent? It's a, f a factor in a surprising way, Frank. Uh, We've already mentioned, but maybe not emphatically enough, that these kids are poor. Uh, once they're out on the street, even if they come from middle-class families, they become poor. But overwhelmingly, the runaway kids are from poor families, from struggling families. You would assume then that they would be heavily minority kids. This isn't the case. Overwhelmingly, the kids who are throwaways, runaways, who hit the streets and work in the life are white. Part of the reason is that the market among the well-to-do men for boys is a white market. The men want white kids. They don't want Chicanos. They don't want black kids. They want white kids, fair kids, Nordic-looking kids, uh, what, the ideal type. What about wealthy black or Chicano males? They also tend to prefer white kids. You can find in what's called the Farm League, uh, in the parks, on the streets, at the curbs, uh, totally on their own, living hand to mouth, roughing it. You can find minority kids, but they have a hard time. They have a hard time getting customers. Mostly, they get employed in the dark, literally. They work in uh, the cubicles, in the uh, magazine stores where their, their customers won't see them. There's an ugly term call, called glory hole for uh, the kind of thing that happens in the cubicles. Uh, I, I, I think the name is suggestive enough yeah. itself what it means. It means that the customer doesn't have to see the person who's servicing him and then the person who's getting the service fantasizes that the little boy is blonde and blue-eyed and white. Well, what and about so Atlanta on. then? Uh, you were talking in, in the previous program about this being the situation with the Atlanta kids. Well, I think there are indications, as I said, that the kids there are hustlers. They are hustlers who are out working to help their families. They are not throwaways. They are not runaways. And they are in the farm circuit. They're working out of a park. Uh, they're not in uh, the penthouses. They're not in call boy services. Uh, black kids are out there working, and they're not getting the best trade. They're getting what is called rough trade. Men who will pay less and want more and be more likely to inflict violence as part of the price. Another thing I'd like to say here is that on the basis of what I've learned over the last three years, 
I have a, a feeling, it, it's not a firm conclusion by any means, but it's a strong feeling that there's a second reason why the kids out there caught up in this are primarily white. The first reason is that the rich men want white boys. But I think there's a second reason, and that is that poor, struggling black families are taking better care of their kids than white families are. They're not pushing them out. The boys aren't running away. They're keeping the, the contact with home, even if they do have to resort to this for economic reasons. And when the families find out it's happening, they accept the kids and they love them. And they don't punish them, reject them, and throw them out. What, what about the kids themselves? What happens to them? Assuming they're ones that live, and can they get out of the life? And what happens to them when they do? What are they like? In the first place, they mostly don't survive. They mostly, literally, don't live to be 20 years old. As far as I know, the best information I have is, is that these kids die. They waste away, they kill themselves, somebody kills them, and that's it. And we're talking about over half. Over half of the kids who make their living this way for a period don't survive adolescence. They don't become adults. Those who do have a tremendously difficult time. Of course it does damage. It does tremendous damage to his self-esteem. You have to grow up with a general bitterness toward, towards adults where you find with all this, all these strangers now into your life where you're literally being used and poured over. Mutilated. It's not even... Damage is a, a quiet word for the, the mutilation of a child's spirit. We cannot take a seven or eight year old and think that seven or eight year old has the same sexual needs and drives and concepts as you and I. Uh, we have to realize that children see things differently, use material differently, and have different ways of integrating experience. Children cannot integrate anal sodomy at eight or nine. Uh, the fact is, it's, it's all they know how to do. It's all they're good at. Uh, I came to know very well a 22-year-old hustler masquerading as a 16-year-old for whom uh, friends and I were able to find a job but it wasn't a good enough job for him. He knew the risks. Over the years, he, although he was white and blonde, he had to do more and more and more for less and less and less, turn more and more tricks a day. As he got older? As he got older. Uh, one of the things that I know happened to him in the last year was that he had to be subjected to uh, penetration with bottles and the men played the game of whether or not they'd break the bottle off in him or not and cut him that kind of thing when he was 17 he didn't have to do that and he got more money at 22 he pretended he was 16 the man pretended he was 16 he got less money he had to turn more tricks but he didn't know what else to do. He felt it was the one thing he was good at. He also admitted to being miserable. What are some of the legal problems here? How come well, more of, uh, one, the organization that's exploiting these boys hasn't been uncovered, and uh, two, the men who are participating in these uh, crimes against well, each other? Well, take the boys' homes, mm -hmm. for instance. Uh, in the case in San Antonio, uh, which is still pending, there was an eyewitness who walked into the room of the director of the home at four in the morning because he was sure there would be a little boy in there. And there was a six-year-old boy in bed with this supposed priest. Now, the eyewitness testimony that a boy was in bed with an old man doesn't do anything in the courtroom. It doesn't prove that there was sex going on. If the little boy testifies, who is going to take the word of a little boy against the word of, say, a real priest? And what little boy is going to say that a priest violated? violated. Uh, it's a hard arrest to make. It's hard to get a warrant. It's hard to get an arrest. It's hard to get a conviction. And then it's hard to get a real sentence. 
very hard. Nobody wants to put anybody away on this kind of charge because the evidence is, by its nature, very, very shaky. And, and very controversial as well. And, and that just points to another facet of this problem is that it, often it's just ignored, pref preferentially ignored by the courts and by the police and by society because they just don't want to believe it's happening. I remember when we did our reports, we thought it significant enough because of the nature of the case involves some Austin personnel and citizens that we put it on the front page because I was shocked personally by it. And when we printed these stories, we just were barraged with letters from people saying, basically, I don't want to read this kind of stuff over my morning coffee. You know, even though it happened, even though we documented it, and we'd gone out of our way to make sure that it was all backed up with fact, people just refused to want us not only to believe it, but to even believe that it happens. So that's part of the problem. And another part of the problem is, of course, we were shocked when we found out the extent and broad nature of this of problem of pederasty and what all it involves. But we were truly shocked when we found out originally, initially when we started this a few years, a few years back, that the police department didn't even know what pederasty was. I mean, I ran in, I won't say the police department, but I know that I was dealing with one officer in sex crimes division who's no longer in sex crimes division. And I was trying to get, do my part for uh, truth and justice and trying to get to the root of the problem. And I said, well, tell me about your uh, case history of pederasty. And he just went blank. He had no idea what I was talking about. Now, to their credit, I will say that the Austin Police Sex Crimes Division has come a long way since then. But if the police don't know what it is, then certainly most members of society won't know what it is. So, so when they see it in the papers, and editors don't know what it is, so they're not going to print it in the first place, but occasionally when it does go through, society just writes it off as an aberration, a very, you know, well, how are, the police, how are the police organized? You mentioned sex crime division, but there's, they also, have a sex the, crime there's division. also the vice squad. So what's... What vice, the sex crimes division is a, is a subset of the vice. Then, no, it's part of homicide in almost every city. Oh, is it? It's part of homicide. Vice has to do with pornography, obscenity, prostitution, things involving consenting adults, which may be crimes if they're performed in public or commercially. A sex crime is uh, something that in, uh, involves uh, a direct violation of the law or involves things with kids or uh, child pornography. Do you have a feel for, say, the budget and the number of personnel in vice squads compared to uh, sex crime divisions in various places? Uh, no, I, I really don't, Frank. It's something I ought to know more about. In other words, the, the emphasis the city, uh, the police department places on one. I do in Austin other. at that time, anyway. At that time, they had three people in the entire sex crimes division, and they were so overworked with just, you know, that's when the choker rapist was around and what have you. And I mean, that's that pretty much exhausts their yeah. time. And they were concerned about the issue, but they just said, frankly, we, we, we're not staffed. We don't have the personnel to do it. Well, rape is a major crime. The incidence is high. Attempted rape is common. It's extremely hard to track down a rapist. These guys are working extremely hard. And then we charge them with the duty of cleaning up the streets. And in Austin, the streets are clean. In Houston, they're not. But how can they go behind the walls and find out what's going on indoors? That's extremely hard to do. Has, has there been much investigation by any police or the FBI or the judicial system of this uh, phenomenon? Or is it that it's a fairly recent phenomenon, or is it just something that they haven't dealt with historically or Currently. There have been legislative investigations. Uh, there was a na national investigation uh, a couple of years ago uh, looking toward the goal of national legislation to protect kids. But no, there hasn't been much. There are some who would like to tell us that the problem does not exist, that to say Houston is a major center for boy prostitution is to overstate the case. That is what the Houston police tell us. And there again, it's not, uh, we don't have as many uh, male prostitutes as we do female prostitutes but when you start talking about juvenile boys 14 15 16 years old two or three cases are too many and uh, we do have a few of those well how would you talking about that a little further how would you define the problem of young boy prostitution in Houston as far as uh, the size of the problem well I'm not going to say it's one of the major problems 
of our city. Again, uh, we have a certain amount of it, and uh, it's our intention to try to keep the lid on it to keep it from getting any worse. Listen to Atlanta police sex crimes detective Douglas McCoy, a 10-year veteran. It is almost at this point, especially at this time of the year, almost an epidemic. Yet only a very few young boys are ever arrested. In 1978, there were seven. So far in 1979, we've had three male prostitution charges. The facts are the Atlanta Police Department is understaffed. Vice and sex crime detectives carry a heavy workload. Rapes, for example, are up almost 100% this year. Boy prostitution is near the bottom on the priority list. The local police have to change their attitudes towards the boys, thinking of them more as victims than as criminals. The change in philosophy has worked for the Los Angeles Police Department and serves as an example for other cities. When you've got a 15-year-old boy uh, out on the street selling his body, you've got to understand why he's out there. It's usually due to a poor home life. Uh, he's there to obtain the necessities of life. And you've got to look at that boy as a victim. Even though he's out there committing uh, the crime of prostitution, you still have to look at him as a victim and why he's out there. When you do bring them in, what do you do with them? You certainly don't just throw them in a county jail somewhere. We, uh, we, it takes us anywhere from two to six hours to interview. You talk to a, one of these boys for two to six hours when you first get them in? Yes, sir. Initially, they, they don't have trust in the police department because usually uh, they've had contact with a uh, uniformed policeman and the uniformed policeman will book them curfew or run away and they're sort of leery of the police department. But we'll sit down and we'll gain the, the kid's confidence. We'll talk to him. We'll tell him if he is involved in anything, that he has no, anything having to do with sex, that he, he has done nothing wrong at all. And uh, we treat him the best we can. We'll keep in contact with the victims and we keep calling them weeks later and we'll go out and we'll buy them lunch and... This is weeks later, you go out and get yes. together and see how the uh, boys see how are doing? Yeah, they're doing, progressing, and uh, they, they call us quite a bit. Rehabilitation for young boy prostitutes necessitates a change in the way they are handled by penal institutions. In San Francisco, boy prostitutes from around the nation congregate near some of the plushest hotels. But in San Francisco, a boy prostitute who was arrested is given special treatment. Sheriff Richard Hungisto has set up a new program to deal with young boys. The heterosexual inmates uh, uh, are very likely to abuse, to rape the uh, younger person or the person they think has had homosexual experiences on the streets. They will take advantage of them uh, by force and sometimes they will be very, very brutal. It's a problem amongst children, juveniles and adults. So what has been your answer here? We house the gay inmates separately. We don't mix them in with the uh, heterosexual population just for that reason. And of course, the same thing is true with juveniles. So as you view this problem and people like this come in off the street, how do you handle it? Well, what we do here is to do what we can to make sure that if there are any psychological problems that they're dealt with, and also to try to aid them with post-release help, uh, giving them uh, opportunities as much as we can to find a job, to have a place to stay and to get back on their feet so that they don't have to sell their bodies to make money. Here in Austin, uh, the sex crime unit now is, uh, to my observation, a solid unit doing the best it can. And they have something that's rare in the whole state. They have an officer whose sole job is to counsel the victims of the sex crimes. She's an old student of mine or a friend of mine. Her job was funded by the U.S. government. She lost her job uh, in the Reagan budget last month, and she had to fight lobby in, in the city council to get retained as a police officer. They've retained her for a year, but the overall budget was cut, and her job uh, you know, will remain in jeopardy, and it's a vital job. If I could just add to the problems of investigation and, and how Tom and I learned about all this. We just finally realized that Tom, thankfully, has, has carried on and updated the material and, and kept a close look. My uh, full participation only lasts for a period of about six months to a year. When you were a reporter? When I was a reporter. And myself and another former editor of the Daily Texan just, as soon as we got 
hooked on it. I mean, as soon as we found out what was going on, we went after it with entire abandon for a good period of three to six months. Almost every day we spent, we forgot our classes, we forgot our work at the newspaper. We just, we were determined to get to the root of it. And after six months, we had touched the tip of the iceberg, and we realized at that time, after spending inordinate amounts of time, money, and energy, which we didn't have to spend already, that we needed to be funded by some sort of organization much larger than ourselves, and a staff much larger than ourselves, to continue it to find out really what was going on. So I can see how law enforcement agencies, with what little funding they have, particularly during a tax time such as ours, that it's hard to do. Uh, and as I said, the more we found out, more questions propped up and the, and the deeper it becomes. There's so many things. If it's all right to range around a little bit here, uh, it ought to be said that in academia there's been virtually no contribution. Uh, I learned about this whole phenomenon as a teacher when a student of mine called my attention to the TV documentary Boys for Sale, which was made in Houston. I was embarrassed that I didn't know anything about the subject mentioned it to sociologists, anthropologists, psychologists, social workers. They didn't know anything about it either. Then I went into the bibliography and found that it was first meager and second heavily oriented toward the defense and explication of the pederast, mm -hmm. like the lawyer's commentary wow. I quoted to you. Uh, it's considered a dirty subject and, and people aren't supposed to go into it. Every semester when I lecture on it, I have students get up and walk out. Uh, I used to have complaints made to the department, to, to the college, to the university, and so on, that I was doing pornographic things in the classroom. Uh, that That's abated, but people still get upset and walk out. Maybe not because they are offended, but because they're emiserated by it and they want to get away from it. Mm. People don't like to look at reality. <laughs> well, especially this, as real as it, this know. stuff is horrible. Uh, at any rate, if if the police department from any major city went over to the major educational institution in its area and asked for a contribution from the faculty, that faculty could co contribute practically nothing. Academics have been not necessarily remiss, but they have been oblivious to this. Can I ask you, unless you it would compromise your information system, how do you go about getting your information? Hmm. Observation, uh, interviewing, and uh, interviewing of many kinds. Interviewing kids, interviewing people who are willing to talk who are on the other side of the street, so to speak, and investigators. Have you uh, written any books or uh, are you planning any articles or studies on this? I'm working on a book and I expect it will not be the, the last book that I'll write about the subject and I'll be teaching a course on it in the spring and as far as I know it'll be the first one ever taught in an American college. Hmm. Can we talk about the mass media treatment? We've kind of hit on it here and there. From what I seem to get, the electronic media, particularly a couple of TV stations, have done most of the work on it and the uh, newspapers haven't done much. With the exception of Mark and uh, Gary well, Fendler. Right, and Gary with the Texan. exception of the, of the Texan. Right. Well, it's interesting, throughout all the things that we did, which we thought and perhaps we were in a minority, but we thought it was information that was in the best public interest to know, or at least be exposed to, was not touched by any other local media in town. Do you have any explanation for this? Why didn't the Austin American Statesman pick up on it? I really don't know. Or the TV station? Uh, Did you ever take it to them? <laughs> but uh, actually, I think the Statesman did run one or two mm -hmm. I think they ran the initial story about Anderson, mm -hmm. the pharmacist being right. left, and that's what sparked our interest, and right. of course. And they dropped Lynn. Did you ever talk to the uh, reporter that did that story and see why they didn't pursue the... No, I don't think I did. I think we got so wrapped up in what we were doing. Mm -hmm. What about down in Houston? Is there any evidence of pressure to keep the, the lid on down there? Well, uh, when Boys for Sale was shown on TV, it was shown first as a nightly series and then there was a summary program, uh, which you'll have excerpts of. The biggest bank in Houston withdrew its advertising from the show and from the station because it showed that program. Wow. But they didn't, they didn't withdraw it until the last... Not the last minute. They kept saying, 
if you don't kill that program tonight, we're going to withdraw our advertising. And they did. And uh, the bank managed to get the other, the other advertisers for that program to withdraw their advertising. Uh, the Houston Post and the Houston Chronicle, again, that story I, I mentioned in the previous program about the bust of this mansion with this incredibly elaborate film studio in it emerges in the Post and the Chronicle as a little place with some cameras. Yeah, and the problem is not so much that, it, that the incidents are ignored, but there's n never any follow-up. There's never any investigation. They just take the easy way out. Something happened, boom, it happened. Next day it's forgotten. What we need in the media is follow-up and investigation on everybody's part so that we won't, so that we'll be, become sensitized to the issue. You had some and threats it, of physical violence also when you were doing this investigation. Well, uh, this... Did you not? We were working with some people from Houston who knew a lot more about it than we did, and they, of course, counseled us and mm -hmm. said, beware. Mm -hmm. I had my windshield broken in. Uh, I mean, a brick thrown through my windshield. Was, I don't know if that was entirely coincidental. I sincerely doubt it just because of the timing and nature of place Well, this may be one very good reason why there, hadn't been a lot of, warning. <laughs> why there hadn't been a lot of investigative reporting of the well, fellow who worked with the story in the Houston. The shotgun incident. Has uh, had some problems. Well, uh, the moderator of the show, Boys for Sale, had a shotgun go through, blast go through his window, and then another one go through his, uh, that, that is the window of his home, mm -hmm. and then another blast go through the windshield of his car as he was a approaching the car to get into it. Uh, that kind of, of signal uh, usually is sufficient to uh, warn a person off. Uh, any one of us in the country, and there aren't very many of us who have worked intensely on this for a period of years, has received threats and uh, has been subject to at least feigned attempts. And the idea is that that should scare us off. It, it has worked with a whole lot of people. The day after part one of Boys for Sale was cable cast, Tom Philpott's van was vandalized. The tires were slashed, and the accelerator was jammed to the floor. And then the following week, Tom was shot in what appears to have been an assassination attempt. Has anybody been killed? Actually, well, uh, what about the guy that wrote the book that he got a shotgun mm -hmm. blast that did wound him, I think, pretty seriously, didn't it? Well, what, what then should society do about this? How can this problem be dealt with? Well, it, it's, a, it's a tall question. Yeah. Uh, law enforcement has to, has to be activated, and it has to be supported, and it has to be seen through, through the end of the procedure so that you don't have congressmen uh, pleading not guilty or no contender and getting no penalty. The kids who are rescued in this process have got to be cared for and helped and no one really knows how to do it but it's got to be done a way has got to be found they've got to be helped and then most obviously we've got to find a way to to uh, reestablish a society which does not throw up literally a half million kids a year onto the city streets and leave them there to to be hurt uh, American families have to have support uh, it, it, it's good enough to say to, to families love your children but they have to have the wherewithal to care for their children, and obviously American families do not. Mm -hmm. These kids are not minority kids in the main, but they're mainly poor kids. They're from hard-driven, hard-living families. Uh, it, and it's so very, very sad. And, and it's so sad that we need to respond to them. We people who, who've got our stuff together and who think we know a lot about a lot of things, we just need to reach out to those kinds of kids. We need to go out there and find them. How quickly can a city like Houston move in this area? Well, we can move as quickly in this area as we should, as we have been in other areas. We can build a billion dollar Houston center downtown, then we can certainly move quickly to solve human problems and problems of people. Father McGinnis, do you see a role for big business in Houston in, in this plan? Yeah, one role is money, you know, and a lot can, let's face it, a lot can be done with money. A lot of alternatives can be offered if we have the money to pay for them. And there's enough excess money in 10 corporations in this city to do anything we would want to to save every one of these kids. Shocking as it is, when you put it in perspective, maybe it's really not 
quite so unexpected considering the history of what the people have been subject to who have been under the control and rule of these people and you start to think about what's been done to the Indians, the terrible working conditions that people lived in for years and worked under for years, the dangerous condition, the pesticides that people are forced to ingest, um, the lack of safety in the places where we work, wars where people are slaughtered. There's really a long history of this and this is, is, is this the same type of impulse turned focused just on a small boy or is this something really unique you think? That isn't easy to answer Frank because in all honesty this subject has baffled me from the time I first became aware of it until this day. I can't understand it. You know, and I'm trying very hard and uh, it's very difficult. Uh, as an historian, I know that this society, probably above all in the world and in the history of the world, romanticizes childhood. But the historical record, uh, child labor, for one thing, indicates that this society has not been good to children, has not prote protected children, in, in fact is contemptuous of children, heartless to children and they're such helpless victims who can they go to what constituency do they have nobody uh, the heartlessness that goes into it is is certainly somehow connected with the heartlessness which uh, ground up the Indians black people uh, immigrant laborers, poor people in general, which is motivating the cuts in social programs today, uh, blindness to the actual living reality of people's situations. Yes, it's connected, but this is the, it's about the most hair-raising thing I think I've encountered in studying the history of my country. The slaughter of the innocents. It's the greatest slaughter of the innocents since Herod. And it goes on and on and on. And when the public gets a, a hint of it, nothing happens. Uh, the case of Price Daniel uh, is uh, instructive there. It came out in, in the custody hearing of Mrs. Daniel, who admitted to shooting her husband, that he attacked their son and there was testimony that uh, he had relations with other adolescents. There wasn't any inquiry as to what that might mean for society. Price Daniel is one of the major names of Texas. And all these other names that we've mentioned of, of people who have been caught and let off. Uh, there doesn't seem to be any willingness to make the connections which you have implied and face them. And it's time we did, right? Yeah, you're damn right it's time we did. Uh, there needs to be police action. There needs to be action in the academy of which I am part to study this. There has to be rehabilitation for kids and most of all American families have got to be put on a footing where their children are not in jeopardy of being lost in this way. The whole society has got to answer for this, do something about it. If we don't make this move, what do you think the results would be in Houston? It would get worse and worse and worse. And there'd be kids killed uh, in the dead of night and dr dumped on the highway like they are right now. It'll get worse, it'll never get better. You don't sit back and see something like this, it's history has proven that, and just watch it and it gets better. It'll get worse, much worse.